There we go. Welcome, everybody. Oh, it's great. Hey, Chuck. Hadn't seen you in a while. Chuck, good to see you. Linda, are you still up in Maryland? Yeah? Okay. Len and Lenny? Terrific. That's okay, Chris. so uh, Paul, we're just. I think you, I think you know that the, that we have uh, our group from this afternoon, and also there'll be another group of people tonight. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, everybody but you and I uh, are muted. Uh, thank you for that, everyone. Uh, we are uh, we're honored uh, to be able to share some time uh, this afternoon with uh, Professor Paul Lips. Uh, Paul has, um, wow, I mean, I, can't, I, I cannot describe for you the impact that he has had on uh, particularly the reform movement because I'm part of a, uh, literally a generation, more than a generation of uh, rabbis uh, who have learned uh, from Paul uh, about uh, Israel uh, and, the his, not only the history of the Jewish state, but the dynamics of the politics of the Jewish state. Uh, at this particular moment, um, he, I, if I were to give you Paul Lips's biography, that would be the hour. Mm -hmm. um, suffice it to say, he has taught everywhere. He has taught everyone. <laughs> um, he has made relations because we visited with him a couple of times on trips to Israel. Uh, he's made relations within the congregation. And uh, we're going to send out a detailed bio, uh, but, but trust me, uh, you are in the presence of an individual who has had a huge impact on the understanding of the state of Israel and many, many different aspects. And today we're going to focus on Judaism in the Jewish state as our title of our, uh, of our lecture today. What we're going to do is we're going to have uh, uh, Paul speak with us uh, for probably about 45 minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to ask you to share questions in the chat as opposed to um, as opposed to uh, trying to uh, interact by coming off mute. Please put them in the chat so that I can share them uh, with uh, with Paul, and we'll do a Q and A towards the end. Uh, but I am uh, particularly in this moment uh, with uh, so many changes going on in Israel, uh, and many of them affecting. Uh, the religious relationships with a reform rabbi uh, coming into the Knesset and potentially into a ministry. Uh, this is a great time to be having this chat. So thank you for joining us, Paul, and uh, please uh, share your wisdom. Good. Thank you very much. Good morning and good evening to everyone. Uh, it's, I'm delighted to be with you. I've actually been uh, to uh, in Austin, Texas on two occasions, very short visits, uh, and on both occasions, it was absolutely wonderful uh, meeting you know, your rabbis and then some of your congregants. So the, the topic of Judaism in the Jewish state is a, a kind of a complex a mix of issues. And uh, um, I've been in Israel now 54 years. I arrived one day before the Six Day War. And I've studied the topic in great detail. Uh, and what I'm gonna try and do is kind of give the, the macro picture, the big picture, of what I think are the main issues of Judaism uh, in the state. One point I think is obvious to all of us that when you are part of a majority religion, uh, that religion becomes much more political and territorial when then where you're a minority group and you're less involved in mainstream politics. So because this is the one country in the world where the Jews are controlling their destiny, or hopefully that's true, um, the whole understanding of what religion looks like in Israel is going to be very, very different from Judaism overseas. And I've visited America maybe 20 times. So Mark, if we can just go on to the next screen. I think Mark's supposed to be moving screens. Thanks, Mark. Um, so what we have here is uh, Yeshua uh, Labovitz, 
who is really one of the central people. By the way, have you got the picture this meeting is being recorded? Is it on your screen or not? No. Okay. So Leibovitz uh, was a very interesting uh, thinker. And um, he really said something which uh, he said this many, many years ago, that Israel is a secular state commonly known as religious. Things have changed considerably uh, since that time. And uh, what I think we have to understand is that today uh, it's much more of a religious, it's a religious state uh, with uh, the majority of the population who are not religious. Religious in Israel, by the way, is totally different from the United States. Uh, most Israelis understand religious as either being ultra-Orthodox, Haredi, or modern Orthodox, and don't consider reform and conservative as being religious. So just some overview points. Firstly, there is uh, obviously a very strong alliance between religion and state. Um, what's interesting that many people think that more and more religion is dominating people's lives, but in fact, there's been a decline of many realms of religious uh, legislation since the 1980s. So many of the conceptions of how we think Israel is in terms of its religiosity are in fact not correct, and I'll try and point this out as we're going uh, along. What is very clear that the religious institutions do not function properly. And just to give one case, and there are many, many cases, is the what happened with uh, Lagba Omer um, at Mount Meron, where it's a under the religious authorities, and it was absolute chaos, 45 people got killed. And that's only one realm of uh, the chaos of religious institutions in this country. Although at the same time, they have uh, significant funding so you would imagine that things would be much better. So as we go on to the next slide, um, we begin to look at the realities. What's really uh, going on here? Uh, back one, please, Mark. And then what we uh, see is uh, in the earlier slide. Sorry, it's, it's in between. It's the uh, one, okay. That's the one. Thank you. Sorry. So realities of Judaism in Israel. So we've got some extremely positive components. Uh, and I think it's always important when we look at uh, uh, Judaism in Israel to realize that it's a, a mixture of good and bad. The good stuff is that uh, the ultra orthodox world in particular has three realms of contribution. And we see that in the first point. There's the Yad Sara loan service for medical equipment. There are very, very few countries that have a loan service for medical equipment as good as Israel. Uh, and in fact, the Yad Sara, the idea has been taken by a vast number of countries around the world. What it actually means is that as soon, as soon as someone is ill and they need equipment and they can't afford it for a very, very minimal uh, check that you give at the beginning, which you can get back if you want it off to using the equipment, you have a massive range of, uh, of medical equipment. Then there's the Zaka rescue and recovery operation, which among other things, uh, and, and it's a very tough job, they pick up the body parts after a terror attack. And then you have Hot Solar, which is a uh, first aid service. Um, for example, in B'nai Brak, a religious area out of Tel Aviv, um, the streets are very narrow, and if someone needs medical services, in many cases, the ambulances can't get through. And so these and people they, are, they, are on little motorbikes, and they, and they get uh, to just about everyone. So where have things got less religious, so to speak? Um, for example, in uh, when I, since I came in 1967, I remember um, in many cases, cinemas were not open. Uh, on Shabbat, they are now. In many parts of the country, you have cinemas open on Shabbat and no one's doing anything about it. Uh, in earlier Israel, it was very difficult to get uh, non-kosher food. The mass influx of Russian-speaking Jews certainly changed that. They brought non-kosher food with them. And now for those for whom it's important, if some Israelis who literally go, who do not want to have kosher food because to them, that represents the power of the chief rabbinate. Now you can get it. And what was once an argument, the rabbinate tried to stop 
uh, baked bread being available during Pesach, that disappeared because uh, some of the Arab villages, you can't stop them baking bread. Uh, many Israelis would go to uh, an Arab village, which they normally not go to, to buy uh, bread. So you've got a lot of Israelis who are angry with the rabbinate um, and therefore find ways of reducing their influence as much as they can. Even in terms of marriage, uh, it's in many young Israelis today, so annoyed with the process of going through the rabbinate, uh, just marry overseas. They go to Cyprus or somewhere else. And it's very interesting that we would kind of normally imagine that uh, Israelis feel the religious interference. But uh, in all the years that I've been here and I've been taught at Israeli universities uh, for uh, over 40 years, when I would speak to my Israeli students about religion in Israel, they would say, oh, it's not even, we're not even connected to it. Because most people, uh, most Israelis, if they have, want to have nothing with uh, the religious authority, we're not talking about contact with religiosity in the broader sense, but they, they can actually move away from having any, almost anything to do with the religious uh, authority, the chief rabbinate in particular, um, a Brit, rather than having a rabbi, they find a general doctor. Uh, uh, bar mitzvah, there are many, many ways of having uh, bar mitzvahs in this country. Some Israelis, by the way, are very happy to have a reform or conservative. And uh, as I say, you can get married in just about any way you want. So the, um, that's, I think, a very important point. And we see certain organizations, among them IRAC, the reform movement, and uh, uh, Seth Farber, he runs an organization also, constantly in the pressures in Israeli society, certain groups are doing everything they can to reduce their influence. By the way, Sunday might be a very, very important moment of Israeli history, because as it looks at the moment, and who knows exactly what's going to happen, with the new government, the two uh, religious parties, the two Haredi parties, will not be in the government. And that immediately is going to have an influence, and they are talking already now about the uh, preparing the Western Wall area, which is part of the Women at the Wall um, movement, uh, making that available for non-Orthodox groups. So we're seeing that <coughs> excuse me, Israeli society can really uh, bring about changes when they, when they want to. Um, excuse me. Um, <coughs> a slow, small number of the Haredim are now in the army, a very small number, about 5,000, um, <coughs> and don't have too much influence. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. So some of some other realities. Um, we know that modern Orthodox and Karadim regard themselves as the only authentic form of Judaism. Um, the Haredim are very, very active in demonstrations. Um, I, I'm, uh, carrying, I'm carrying out a 10-part uh, program in Israel at the moment based on demonstrations. And the most active group of all subgroups in Israeli society are those who, uh, the Haredim, who have uh, that point. Um, I won't take all the issues, but uh, generally among the uh, Haredim, even more so than the modern Orthodox, there is broad discrimination against women. Just to give a, a case, um, at the moment, there's, uh, there's uh, several women in uh, about to get into the government, hopefully will come about on Sunday. And what the Haredi do is they actually take out the picture of the women. And they even do that, they've done this in 2015 with uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. There were three women ministers. And in the Haredi newspapers, for example, you would see a picture, but with no women. And this is kind of one of the very sensitive realms of Israeli society. Israeli women are upwardly mobile in the middle of all things. And suddenly they will find in a certain picture uh, you know, there are seven men and there were two or three women, and suddenly the women disappear. So these are the, are the uh, uh, parts which make Israeli society uh, very, very uh, angry. Um, in addition to which, we'll come a little later to the Reform and Conservative uh, movement, in addition to the Muslims and the Christians, 
who receive limited state funding. Just if you look at the right hand side there in April, there was a very interesting event and it's just a case study. You know, we shouldn't think that the, when we use the word Haredi, uh, ultra-Orthodox, that it's one group, it's, it's divided and it's actually a society in ongoing tension. And I'm just giving one case study here at the Lithuanian Pozhenev Seminary. It's absolutely a beautiful building. You can see the outside and then you can see the inner areas. It's really a, kind of one of the elite Haredi yeshivot uh, in the state of Israel. Um, last month, there was an, an ongoing a battle of fisticuffs. People were hitting each other between two sections, a uh, group, one group called the terrorists and the other group called the haters. And it was all about rival rabbis vying for yeshiva leadership. The point I'm making, I'm not trying to sort of uh, make uh, headlines of a newspaper or something, but what I think is very important for us to understand is that in, from the outside, we sometimes look at Haredi and modern Orthodox as kind of that they are in control of things. In reality, you find that they're in ongoing tension within themselves. Not only do they have tension with the other groups, the non-Haredi or non-modern Orthodox groups, but even among themselves. As we go into the next uh, slide, I think we're beginning to see uh, as kind of a more um, um, interesting component and a very inter uh, a sort of a, a problematic point, if we just go back to the uh, army one, please. Uh, what we see in the Israeli army is that there's an attempt to bring the Haredim into the army. And there are two schools of thought, very divided on this issue. The one issue, the one theory says, if they in the army, they will then receive skills and they will become part of the working population. By the way, the fact that only a minimal number of Haredim actually work, by the way, the, given, the government figures are incorrect because if someone does a little bit of work, that person is defined as a worker and it's really uh, not correct. So the, the one thesis said, let's try and get the Haredim into the army. I belong to the second school of thought that says, I, I don't know if we want them there. As soon as they're in the army, what you essentially find is, Excuse me. What you essentially find is that the, the rabbinut starts getting involved in army affairs. And that's very, very dangerous. So, you know, there's the theoretical situation of uh, in, in war or something like that on Shabbat <coughs> that the, um, the rabbi would say to the Haredi soldiers, don't obey your officer. I mean, you can imagine the chaos uh, of that kind of situation. And um, the, uh, the influx of the Haredi rabbinate into the army, they're essentially religious commissars um, trying to influence secular soldiers uh, brings about uh, a tremendous amount of tension. So once again, you know, we, we, we often hear won't it be good if the Haredim are getting into the army or in other parts of Israeli society? And then the other side is what happens to the army as a result of that. In addition to which, by the way, it's very problematic with women. Uh, the Haredim and, and even the modern Orthodox, in many cases, don't want to hear women singing. And there's a, uh, the women singing group and the dancing group and the music group of the Israeli army is well known. And so um, you have cases where women are starting to sing and soldiers at a, at a show or something, a certain soldiers get up and walk out. Or if there's a woman officer in a particular position, they say, we, we don't want to, we won't listen to her. So this question of serving in the army, uh, as I say, has the two theories, which are constantly part of uh, national discussion. Um, with the next uh, uh, slide, we will begin to see uh, the probably the most important sign of change, and it's a silent revolution. Uh, the figures, I think, are, are quite fascinating. Um, firstly, that we see uh, Haredi women uh, in, in, uh, um, in increasingly receiving advanced uh, degrees, 
There are different places they learn. Sometimes they go to regular universities. Some of the universities have Haredi women only studying. Um, but what's exceptionally important is that 76% of, of all Haredi women are employed where the national figure for women is 83%. So what's actually happened is the Haredi women are in the workforce. They're genuinely in the workforce. And you see with the picture uh, on the right hand side, you see secular women wearing slacks and Haredi women wearing various lengths of skirts. Um, that's very important. Change, it seems, uh, and I'm a social historian, real change comes essentially in societies uh, because of the women. Secular women uh, are, are, um, are, are obviously in the learning realm, but increasingly Sephardic Haredi women are becoming interested in studying secular subjects, um, much less so with the Ashkenazi Haredi women. Um, there are now partnerships between Haredi women and uh, secular women. 30% of Haredi women drive cars. Well, that's more important than we can ever imagine. Mobility of people brings about a major change. And the woman we see there in the hat is really one of the most impressive Haredi women we have in the country, Adina Bar Shalom. Uh, she's the daughter of the late Avadeh Yosef, the probably the most important Sephardi rabbi that we've ever had in the country. And she received the Israel prize, the top prize that we have in Israel for lifetime uh, achievement. And I think the pictures that I've chosen, uh, I'll show it. We see Adina, very impressive person. We've seen a woman secular and religious together. We see a woman, uh, an Arab woman and a Haredi woman uh, together studying. And we see a Haredi woman in the workplace. So this is the silent revolution. There's also a, a perspective that you'll see later of the fact that Haredi numbers are increasing. And so we have these the two counter theses of, is it an issue of demography or is it an issue of the changing power of uh, Haredi women? Uh, onto the next slide, we see modern Orthodox uh, women, religious Zionists. So these two terms are interchangeable. Here also there's some very important changing coming about. Once again, the women factor, Men in the religious world tend to be very conservative uh, in uh, a small c. The women certainly go through a greater change. Modern Orthodox are between 12 and 15% of all Jews in the country, but tend to be very right-wing, right-wing in the political sense, not only in the religious sense. That means right-wing in terms of keeping the territories, developing settlements uh, and things like that. What's happened with modern orthodoxy generally, and this is the men and the women, is that they've actually become an increasingly central role within the Israeli army. And many years ago, the kibbutz movement provided the officers and the elite units. As time goes by, the, uh, um, the uh, modern orthodox are involved in it as well. The modern orthodox cover the whole uh, spectrum of society. They're in Sofim scouts. The youth movement, Sofim, is very, very powerful in Israel, ranging from uh, secular, religious, and all the other subgroups. Their uh, religious kibbutzim, very impressive. I spent time on some of the religious kibbutzim, and they've been very successful in the business world. Um, they believe that the territories, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, are the liberated territories, not the conquered territories. Uh, they include some very radical groups you call, see down there in the middle on the left-hand side, Lahava, which is a totally racist subgroup, which has been causing tremendous crisis recently uh, in Israel. And Tagnachir, uh, which is a, a, also a kind of a group which works uh, within the realm of trying to move, it's really essentially a racist organization. Um, the figures show that uh, in surveys done between 1978 and, 2000 and uh, 2008, political terrorism, not, uh, um, we're not talking about Arab terrorism or religious terrorism, but political terrorism in 90% of the cases was by national religious Jews. We're talking, for example, about the hilltop Jews, religious Jews you might've heard about 
who attack Palestinian villages in, in the territories. The good news, these things are tough. The good news is just once again, a case study, hopefully a, a sign of the future. And that's the, the, the picture we see the, the lady sitting on, on the bottom of the, of the screen there. Rabbanit Shira Mervis uh, is a woman, uh, see she maintained that women uh, who is now actually the, uh, the only case that we have of a, of a modern Orthodox woman being the sole spiritual leader. That's in Ifrat, a larger city, maybe some of you have been there. Now, what's important here, there have been women spiritual leaders before, but always with a man, under a man. Here we have the first time where she is the uh, sole spiritual leader. And I think uh, the, what she herself says is fascinating. She writes, while abroad, she was, for the first time, exposed to reform communities where she saw women taking on roles and activities not accepted in the Orthodox world. You know, case studies are extremely important in terms of societal change. And here, just as one case, in Efrat, well known, uh, uh, it's a large, uh, comfortable middle class town in the territories. But there has her being the religious leader there uh, is an extremely important point. Once again, tough issues and good issues are very much part of our uh, reality. In the next slide, we uh, see some other changes within the modern Orthodox world. And I'm just taking a, a certain number of institutions and realms. Each one in itself doesn't say all that much. But when we put all together, we begin to see that societies really find it very, very hard to be stagnant. There are certain societies which are stagnant around the world, but at the same time, even very ultra-Orthodox, ultra-conservative societies actually have small levels of change. And even if it's slow, in the long run, it, it could be very uh, significant. So just to take a, a few of the case studies, baby naming and bat mitzvah for girls. There was a time when the idea of a bat mitzvah for a girl, which is so obviously part of uh, the reform movement, the, um, it's starting to happen. Um, we see, as I mentioned earlier, upward mobility in the work realms. And then there are a number of institutions. Now I must say something about the institutions. They, um, they are not mainstream. So it would be incorrect to say that the modern Orthodox world is changing from uh, grassroots up. That isn't what's happening, but there are institutions on the side and slowly as time goes by, there are modern Orthodox people who have problems with modern Orthodoxy uh, and are therefore wanting to carry on being modern Orthodox, but within a more open environment. And so each of the institutions which we see here are important. Firstly, Kiliat uh, Yedidia, uh, a modern Orthodox synagogue. Uh, we as a family lived in Jerusalem for about 45 years. Um, and it was qu quite amazing uh, when I would every now and again, though, for a Friday night service or Shabbat morning service, to see um, what was happening with modern Orthodoxy in terms of women. Increasingly, women were involved. Um, it was a slow process. Initially, within Yadidia, there was some kind of tension, and then it became a norm. And some, even in Yadidia, some of the women were a talit or tefillin, which in mainstream orthodoxy, you would not find it. Then you have Pardes. Pardes is a highly successful institution. Um, it's it's uh, mainly for foreign people, but they have uh, programs for Israelis as well. Uh, Machon Hartman, uh, the reform movement, many rabbis from the United States have been involved in the Machon Hartman uh, programs, an excellent um, center. I, I've, I've taught its various stages there. Then you have uh, Medreshet Lillianbaum, which is, you see the picture over there for girl, many young women, American women on the one hand and Israeli women on the other hand, where it teaches Midrash, Tanakh, and Talmud, once again, we're not talking about mainstream, but we're talking about organizations which slowly but surely influence society. Nishmat is very important. Machon Torani Nashim Aviva Zorenberg, an amazing educator. Um, she, you know, as a woman educator in the modern Orthodox world can uh, influence uh, things. 
And what is fascinating, and I've been doing some research on this in the last few years, religious women in the army. The modern Orthodox rabbis are totally against um, religious women going in the army, but there's certain schools um, and uh, the famous uh, Professor Alice Shalvey, who, in, who started this kind of idea, and in her particular school in Jerusalem, she encouraged the young religious women to go into the army. The surveys show that unlike what the, the rabbis believed, that the army would corrupt religious women, all uh, the overwhelming uh, majority of religious women who served in the army described it as a positive experience. We know that initially there were tensions. Um, a religious woman who lived uh, in a very close kind of environment suddenly finds herself in the army in, in an interaction with men which she may never have had uh, before. Uh, and certainly when coming into contact with the secular women who have uh, sexual relations before marriage, um, and we know that for some of the religious women, it was quite a shock. But what they say in the surveys uh, done, and at the end of this um, slideshow, you'll see a, a, a basic bibliography. What we know from the research, very good research, that they say that, you know, at a certain time after a bit of a shock at the beginning, they developed a wonderful uh, friendship and interaction, accepting that in many realms they were different, certainly on theological uh, components, but just as human being, they could get on well with each other. I think that's very important because we don't have all that many meeting points between us. Um, I've had a great deal of contact with modern Orthodox and Haredi people because I'm interested in the topic, but there can be many, many secular Israelis who've actually never spoken to someone who belonged to those two groups. So these are the meeting places, one-to-one uh, -one personal meetings. We know it is the major factor which influences the way that people look at the world. And so clearly religious women in the army is one of it. By the way, it's not the majority. Uh, some of them choose what is called national service, which is also very important, going serving in hospitals, schools, um, outlying um, um, disadvantaged areas. So their contribution is important, even if it isn't within the Israeli army framework. On to the next slide, please. We start um, uh, seeing yet um, something which is much closer to us. And um, this is the, what we call traditional. The word in Hebrew, misorti, is somewhat uh, problematic because misorti is identified with the conservative movement. Here I want to talk much more uh, in the two slides that we have now uh, about what's happening within our world. The world, um, it, it can be sometimes described as the non-halachic world, although there are people uh, who both in the reform and conservative movement who would not agree with the def their definition of being non-halachic, but essentially people who are out of the mainstream what, of religiosity. What are we talking about? the uh, ultra-Orthodox, the Haredim are 12% of society, the modern Orthodox are 12 to 25%. We put those on the side and we come to this broad group called a uh, traditional. Um, the traditional phenomenon is quite hard to explain. And the problem really comes up in a very, very uh, interesting realm. When we're trying to um, give cognitive analysis, of religiosity in, in Israel. There are two components which kind of play in some ways against each other. One is mitzvot, commandments, and the other is emunah, belief. And so when we're trying to even get to figures, and I'm, I'm handing and using figures which I think are consensus figures, but even within the figures, there's a tremendous amount of, of problematics. For example, just to put it on a regular uh, level, um, so in the testing, in the questions, and there's tremendous amount of questions which go on in Israeli society in terms of who we are. We're one of the most tested countries in the world. Uh, everyone's kind of always amazed at that, how high our statistics of testing are. But when we, we test the uh, people, there's a, a, sometimes a very uh, interesting uh, diversion in terms of the statistics. 
Um, for example, you have people who regard uh, kashrut as the most important issue, regard Shabbat as absolutely important. When you become to belief, some of them are kind of a bit wishy-washy. Uh, where is the Almighty? Where is God? Uh, those are kind of issues. So we have these, this kind of a mixture of information um, that we're dealing with. When we take the traditional group, which is the largest of all, probably something in the, in the region of uh, 40, 45% of all Israelis would see themselves as traditional, which might range from someone who says, of course, we, we're not secular because we have Pesach and we know what Hanukkah is and we light the candles of Hanukkah. And uh, you know there would be a number of those kind of components over to the tradition who are very, very close to the modern Orthodox. In this very broad group, of some 40% of all uh, Israelis, um, there, there are tremendous differences. One is between Sfardim Mizrahim, the majority are actually Sfardim Mizrahim, people, um, we, we're using the term in the broad sense, people who essentially are North Africans, originally some of them uh, came out of Spain in 1492, but the majority are actually Sfardim Mizrahi, very much influenced by the countries they came from. They, to a large extent, came from Arab traditional Muslim societies. So therefore they, without even realizing it, when they came to Israel, they were on the more religious side of the traditional world. Whereas many uh, Ashkenazim weren't really in the traditional camp, they were kind of more, I am religious, I am modern Orthodox or Haredi, or I am secular. So that's why the traditional group tends to have a significant number of, of Mizrahim. Just let me give you a very interesting a little case study. And that was when we were living in Jerusalem, I um, had an interesting experience with our next door neighbors. Our next door neighbors were originally of Moroccan origin. And the oldest son had been in South Africa for a number of months and um, had quite a lot of contact with the religious groups in South Africa and came back and he was actually, um, every time we met each other, we would meet at the, at the local bus stop, he would ask me questions. And one day he said to me, I understand you teach in that college over there um, that Rabbi Friedman mentioned, Hebrew Union College. For half my life, my life I was at HUC and half my life I was at uh, Israeli universities. So uh, you know, so I said, yes, you know, I, I am. And he says, what do you do there? So I, speaking in Hebrew, I said to him, well, I teach um, rabbis, cantors, and educators, um, both men and women. So he looked at me, and he wasn't in the, in the religious camp. He was in the traditional camp. He looked at me, and he said, you know, Paul, you know, I know you've been a long time in Israel, but, you know, you're obviously making a mistake because there's no such thing as a woman rabbi. So this is kind of why when we talk about this traditional group, we find a, a tremendous sense of, of, of differences. However, the large traditional group is extremely important for the conservative and reform movement. We in the reform movement and those in the conservative movement very much see, uh, we see ourselves not in the secular camp. What, whatever the chief rabbinate can ever say about us, that is of no value to how we see ourselves. We see ourselves in a very important role of essentially offering an opportunity to Israelis who want realms of religiosity, but seeing what's going on in the Haredi and modern Orthodox world are often totally pushed over to the side and feel that they have no connection with religion. It, it worries me deeply that Israelis who are looking for religion if they often don't meet a conservative or reform environment, then they're going to become totally secular and very angry. And I mentioned that at the beginning, there's a deep sense of anger, trying to find alternatives to the, not to religion per se, but to the religious authority. That's really what we have to understand. It's the religious authority, the rabbinate in its various forms, which makes many secular Israelis angry, although they 
themselves are very interested in religiosity, by the way, coming from the fact that in the Israeli school system, Tanakh, Bible studies, is a very central part of their education. So they have a sense of tradition, of Jewish tradition, but when they see it presented um, only within the synagogue, by the way, there, there are many Israelis who say, synagogue I don't go to is the orthodox, but essentially what we find here is trying to find a place where Israelis who do not want to go to an Israeli traditional, to an Israeli orthodox synagogue can find religiosity for them. Israelis are looking for things. Old time Zionism doesn't resonate in such an exciting way anymore. And therefore what we can do as part of the traditional world is extremely important. Towards the, the bottom there, you see the Tali schools. Tali, Tali schools are uh, started with the conservative movement, the reform movement came important. It's once again, this little uh, realm that I mentioned, um, some of our children had gone through that, where they might be in what is called an Israeli secular school, but there's still levels of religiosity in the uh, program. The, um, uh, the, the Supreme Court in particular, has been a very good friend of both the reform and the conservative movement um, because they are deeply uh, trying to ensure that democracy in Israel will remain and are very frightened in the realms of religion where it seems that it's very far from democracy. If you look at the red uh, figure at the bottom there, 2018 survey, showed that 13% of Israelis identified with reform and conservative. That's a very, very significant number. That means if they identify and know about it, that is some sort of expression of where we might be going in the future. And just on to the next slide, it will be the last but uh, second slide. We'll look particularly now for a few minutes at what's happening within the reform movement. Now, I've been very involved in the reform movement, not only at Hebrew Union College, but also within the Nifty framework and the World Union for Progressive Judaism. So I, I must be honest that, that at various stages during uh, my involvement, um, now well over 40 years, uh, I, I would feel it's one step forward, two steps back. So at any particular time, we really have this question of, are, where are we getting? However, I just want to mention where I think we've gained. And um, this to me is a good sign. I mentioned initially that on Sunday with the uh, new uh, government, um, we see uh, Gilad Kariv, a uh, very, very uh, vocal man. He's speaking there with his hands and he see he's um, um, in the Labour Party, Emet Bo Politica, Emet is the the uh, code word of the of the Labour Party to have a and Rabbi Friedman mentioned it to have a reform rabbi in the Knesset at the moment. Um, I'm not don't think he's going to get a ministerial position at this time, but he could well get it in the future. So what are where are the good things uh, in terms of the reform movement? Firstly, Supreme Court recently came out with a, a decision that converts um, through non-Orthodox, uh, of non-Orthodox denominations in Israel must be considered Jews for citizenship purposes. It's a long kind of issue, a long court case, went on for many, many years. It's very important. Then IRAC, the uh, Israel Religious Action Center, and IMPJ Kiddush, which also deals with some of these uh, issues. IMPJ, the uh, reform movement, uh, on the ground. We have over 30 congregations and IRAC is very much involved in things like uh, 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 work for women, uh, women at the wall, we see the picture there. And uh, the reform movement carries about a lot of translations of texts. Um, uh, Non-Orthodox groups can uh, now bid for government um, money for Jewish identity projects. At a certain time, what is called Jewish identity projects were only in the hands of the modern Orthodox. Now we can also apply and we do get money. Um, state pays salaries to non-Orthodox town rabbis. Once again, a long, long process 
um, in trying to get the money because it's state money and there's no reason why we shouldn't get it. Here, there we see uh, um, a good friend of mine, Rabbi Steve Bernstein, with his uh, famous guitar. He's the rabbi uh, on, of Keilat Birkat Shalom on Kibbutz Gezer, getting a salary, a government salary now. The, um, there, within the Israeli military, which at a certain time would not allow non-clergy to get involved in funerals, now uh, that has changed. We see um, women at the wall, um, very, very active, and um, certainly uh, Gilad Kariv. Just the very last slide, just to give you a sense of uh, the um, documentation which we have. Um, this is just a small, a, a little, you know, just the tip of the iceberg of the kind of interesting material we have. You'll see my email address there, plitz at gmail.com. You're absolutely welcome to write to me to ask me any questions. This is just kind of a, um, an attempt to show you the range of kind of material we have, whether it's about uh, the Haredim or, or the Gushimonim, those people who live in the territories are dancing at both weddings and all the other titles you see there. It is for those of you who are interested in um, complex but fascinating events within Israeli society, sometimes very depressing and other times very, very encouraging. Um, this kind of these sources among many others which are available um, are, are certainly open for, for wider use. To my very last comment, and then we can go on to chat questions. Um, I think it's very important to, um, to point out that the uh, government on Sunday is a different kind of government. Uh, I don't think they'll bring about too much radical change because they're very, very broad in, in what they're doing. But basically, it's good news. If the government comes about on Sunday, the, uh, the, the prime minister, the first prime minister, um, uh, Bennett. He has uh, said that we're going to get our own place, the non-Orthodox groups with own place at the Western Wall. This has been opposed at all stages by the Haredim. This, by the way, is, I think, uh, going to be a major event. We'll be on the forefront. We'll be at the Western Wall. Um, and I think that uh, if everything goes okay, and we're never quite sure what's going to happen in politics, things are good for us as reformed Jews in Israel. And I'm looking forward to seeing you not only in the little boxes, but when you come to visit Israel on a congregation tour sometime, hopefully in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Fabulous. Okay, so we got about 10 minutes. So I'm going to go right to the questions. Uh, just wonderful. Um, we're asking uh, the, the, the two uh, organizations at the outside on the first slide, Yad, Sarah, and Zakah. What, the question came up, what makes them religious? They seem to be performing a secular function. Okay. The, they are um, ultra orthodox people who do those activities. So, for example, Yad, Sarah, they have a beautiful building. Um, if you ever come to Israel and you're uh, next to um, Yad Vashem, next to Yad Vashem, there's this massive, massive building, and it was established by uh, the ultra-Orthodox mayor of Jerusalem many years ago, and the people who work there, not only the many different kind of people work there, but the, the, the leadership and the financial side and the whole project came about with ultra-Orthodox people. The two other groups, uh, 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 Zaka, you see them on the streets, you will see that they are almost all religious people who are going through this unbelievably difficult issue of picking up the uh, body parts. And the hot salah, um, you see them around the country. Once again, not all of them are religious, but one, it's an, a religious organization which goes out to the wider population of Israeli society, regardless of whether it's um, uh, Jewish or non-Jewish, that's what they do. So this is this is really an important uh, contribution. And you know, I know I myself sometimes find that, that I'm getting sort of into an angry situation. Then I have to sort of move back a little bit and say, hold on, we have our differences, but they also contribute. And I think that's really the way that we're going to have to go forward in the future. 
that um, it leads to that that last comment leads into a, 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 a quick question. Is there any in, in are there any such thing as Jewish and Muslim schools and how are they regarded? So there are about eight or nine mixed schools. Um, there uh, they are dual language, bi bilingual schools. Um, by the way, there's another framework of bilingual, which is Hebrew and English. So we've got family members who go bilingual Hebrew English schools. They spend time in America, and so they wanted to carry on with the kids' English. But we talked about a different bilingual, and it's by by ethnic, I suppose we might call it. There, as I say, there are eight of them. Um, how are they regarded? Is a totally depends on one's political perspective. If you right wing it's very, very unlikely that you think it's a good idea. And because there are these organizations like La Hava, which is the most racist organization that you can think, by the way, the reform movement wants La Hava to be, find as, to be defined as a terrorist organization, which kind of gives you a feeling of uh, what you're talking about. So on, on, on the right and extreme right, these mixed schools are looked at as very, very negatively. As you go to the center left and the left, they then you respect it. You can say what I would certainly believe, um, you know, pe parents should send their children to whatever schools they want to. Some very good friends of ours have uh, uh, children in one of those schools in, in Jaffa, the one of the mixed cities which sort of blew up recently. And so they're difficult days, and these are difficult times in Israel at the moment with, with deep uh, ethnic uh, problems. Um, but once again, it, it's the open society of Israel has to provide possibilities for different alternatives. Uh, and that's what we've been fighting against essentially for the last 20 years or so. We're hopeful, once again, Judaism is about being hopeful and looking to a better future. We are certainly hopeful that uh, uh, Israel from Sunday onwards will be a better Israel than it has been up till now. Uh, amen, be amen. Uh, also, um, okay, so another, another slightly different direction. Uh, wh what's the current status of people who are converted in the United States uh, by non-Orthodox uh, movements? Uh, in terms of their status in Israel? I, I think it hasn't yet been worked out. I think it's it's in, in the process. You see, the, the, um, the Supreme Court decision, it hasn't quite been tested. Uh, let me tell you where the problem lies. We're a complex country. Supreme Court decisions then have to be translated by the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Religious Affairs. Supreme Court is an open-minded, essentially apolitical body, somewhat different from the American model. The uh, Interior Ministry and the Religious Affairs Ministry is under the control of the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox. So the interpretation of Supreme Court decisions then has to be tested when it goes through the various ministries. And I, I have a feeling that this is gonna be the big test in the coming months to see exactly what's gonna happen with some of these issues. By the way, but I have to add another point. Israel only survives by, by regarding laws, and excuse my definition, and Israeli law, I define it as something that you might want to take into consideration if you're in the mood. You'll see a little bit of cynicism in my definition. The reason is that we are not a legal society. And therefore, and I'll just give the famous case study, the very significant number of Russians who arrived here in the 1990s and later, who were not Jews, the figure there's something like 300,000. So you would imagine if things went by the law, they couldn't then get married but I'll tell you, they're getting married somehow. 
So the, the lack of legality is the only way we survive in this country. And I know when I'm come to the United States and uh, you know, uh, uh, the policeman, the cop says, you know, you've been going too fast. In Israel, it's the start of an argument, uh, not anything else. So this is really, it, 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 you know, I, I, when I came as a, an immigrant, uh, I'm originally from uh, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. I, 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 I spent my first year in total shock. And by the second or third year, I began to realize, forget about everything that Britain ever taught me because it was a British colony and just go into another world. And that's why the organizations, the reform organizations which work here are so important as pressure groups because everything in this country works by pressure, not essentially by laws. I know it's a little bit frightening for people like yourselves from America, but that's every country kind of works in its own kind of way. We don't have as many guns as you, so, um, so we're all in different situations. <laughs> okay, so I wanna confirm something, though um, we're gonna wrap up about two minutes, but I wanna confirm something though. Was the current status that if someone is converted by a non-Orthodox rabbi in the States, they're entitled to make Aliyah, but they're not recognized by the rabbinate as Jew, rabbinate that's, as Jewish. That's, that's essentially the case, but I'm not sure what's going to happen now in view of the last decision by the Supreme Court. So that's really okay. what it's about. And, and, and as I say, having looked at what happened with the uh, Russians, um, uh, by the way, the same thing with the Ethiopians. There were problems initially with Ethiopians getting married and things, and then like all those other things in Israel, slowly but surely through pressure, systems were worked out and eventually, you know, things were cleared. But uh, so that's the nature of Israeli society. You know, we are young. We, we are a young society and, uh, and, and we've moved very fast in some realms, and, uh, but we still have to push in other. Okay, so let's end on a somewhat lighter note. And uh, we had a question about uh, the ultra-Orthodox and popular culture. Uh, do, do, do the ultra-Orthodox watch all the cool Israeli shows that we get on Netflix? <laughs> I'm sure they do, but they would never say it openly. <laughs> I'm positive they watch Tiso. You see, this is this country. This is this whole country. I want to tell you something fascinating on that issue. I, I've just got two minutes, so I'll, I'll say it quickly. I want to give an idea, this, this phenomenon that I'll never forget. A friend of mine was at the Hebrew University in charge of the computer center many years ago on Mount Scopus. And uh, they were very interested because it's quite close to Meir Sharim. They were fascinated that a significant number of young Haredi men were coming up to look at the computers. Now, our friend who's kind of rather a naive person, he was delighted. He thought that the Haredim were becoming, uh, adopting computer science. He didn't realize, but he soon learned that whenever he looked at what screens they were looking at, it wasn't really an interest in computer science, but in pornography. So, you know, this is this point. Why do I, why do I make this point? because the nature of the human being is that what you can't have, you actually want. So my answer to the excellent question is yes, I am totally convinced that they see, although they have these signs, you know, on the, you know, on, on the, on the boards in Meir Sharim, you know, don't do this and don't do that and don't do everything else. I think, you know, in, in the some back rooms in the in the pool room of the Haredi society, I think they're watching absolutely everything. And if they're watching Shtisel, the third edition, third round, I think they're probably enjoying it as well. So I think, I think that's the real world. <laughs> that is a wonder that, that 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 is a wonderful way to end with a smile. And uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I'll respond to. Uh, separately uh and uh mark do you recall what's our next day do you recall them off the top of your head um i've got it here it is a week from today i mean